He's still here and he's still working through all of this. Hey, do you believe that today? Because, you know, we're all exhausted, right? We're all just tired and weary. And exhaustion comes in a lot of forms. It can be emotional exhaustion, mental exhaustion, physical, spiritual exhaustion. And that's the problem, I think, in these days. What makes this season really difficult is the fact that it seems that this pandemic is impacting our lives for a long time to come. That compounds the exhaustion and the weariness. And so today, I want to talk to you about how to walk through very difficult, dark times in life. Now, before we get to that happy thought, and it does have a happy ending, I've got a happy announcement that I'm going to make today. Perhaps you heard earlier this week, we've announced that we are coming home. September the 27th is the date we're coming home home. Working with our, our leadership, our staff, our deacon leadership, with our, with our medical experts, we've decided that September the 27th is the date. It's a good day. It's wise. It'll be safe. It'll be a wonderful time for our church family specifically. Given our, uh, the makeup of our church family, our architecture, all those good things, we are going to come together on September 27th. I know this right away. Some of you think, man, that's too soon for me. That's okay. We're going to continue to be coming online and we hope that you'll join us as soon as you can. For others, you're thinking that's way too late for me. Well, hey, thank you for your patience. I think it's too late for all of us who want to be together. Early April was too late uh, to come back together. And so I'm thrilled today that we are coming home. Now, listen, we're going to uh, be continuing to get the campus ready. Our staff team is working now, even, even now, to be sanitized and safe. And we're going to have socially distanced um, you know, services together. But they will be spectacular. On launch, uh, launch, launch weekend, that's September the 12th and 13th, launch weekend, we're going to have some outdoor events for, for our kids, for our students. And then we're going to launch on that day into New Times on the 13th, New Times Online. Not yet in person on the 13th. We're going to have 9 o'clock in the Great Hall. We're going to have 11 o'clock in the Sanctuary and 11 o'clock in the Great Hall. Then uh, in Espanol has already moved to a later time uh, online. So those will be new times online. Watch for that. And we're going to have We Worship and Kids Worship when we come back uh, in person on September the 27th. Watch for new fall discipleship classes online as well. We have an FAQ that's coming out soon on our website. And then you can ask all of our, uh, all your questions to our Restart team. Uh, you, can, you can call us or contact us, or you can just go to restart at pcbc.org. You can see it right there. So, hey, I love you. I miss you. And I, I can't wait until we're together. I know you miss each other. So it is so exciting to announce that we are coming home. You know, the fact that we miss each other uh, is one of the challenges in this season, that we can't be together, we can't encourage each other. Here's what I want you to do. If this is your church, uh, I want you to just right there on the chat, right there, you can, just, you can just say, hey, this is my church. Just put that in there for me right there. This is my church, all right? I'm not a consumer. I'm not just peering in. I, I'm, I'm, I am, I'm not just observing. This is my church. Now, listen, if it's not your church or if you're just visiting, we're so glad that you're here. You could pop that in there too. Say, hey, I'm here visiting. Love you guys. Tell us where you're coming from. We'd love to reach out to you, all right? But I want to encourage you today. Today, we're going to uh, continue this series called Not Okay. What we've been saying is that it's okay to not be okay. And I hope that you feel that today. We had a collective kind of mass confession last week. We can do it again now. I'm not okay. Okay, we're not okay. I'm ready for this thing to be over. But remember, last week, if you were with us, I reminded us all that uh, life is, is a story. And we're in the middle of our story. The middle is not the end. Too often in our lives, we compare the beginning of our story with somebody's middle or the middle of my story with somebody's end. But we're all in the middle of a story and there's meaning in the middle. There's a miracle in the middle. We even said that the end of the story is not the end for the follower of Jesus. And so today we're going to join David in a lament, a cry in Psalm 13. Go ahead and grab your Bible, turn to Psalm 13. Because collectively, individually, we're asking the question that David is asking. How long, right? How long is this going to keep on going? And so I'm going to challenge you to first rethink your, uh, your limits. All right, that may sound strange. We'll explain that. Then reset your focus. And then finally, recalibrate your worship. All right, so I've talked to so many people. I'm, I'm asking everybody, how are you doing? 
how are you doing? And, and most everyone responds with, I'm tired. Okay, not I'm busy. That would have been pre-COVID. I'm busy. Now it's I'm tired. So you can be maybe less busy, less active, and be even more exhausted. Uh, you, you can have mental exhaustion. Uh, you know, I'm tired of thinking about that thing. I'm tired of thinking about this uh, coronavirus. Parents are tired of making decisions. I found myself recently just frustrated. Like I'd get home, you know, uh, I've been working all day and, and I'm just frustrated over simple decisions. Like, hey, what do you want for dinner? <laughs> I don't know. I'm tired. I'm tired of making decisions. Uh, I don't want to make any more decisions today. Well, listen, I want you to know that it's okay to struggle with exhaustion. All right. It's okay to be being sick. How about this? Being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so I want to encourage you today. The first thing I want you to think about with me is this. Rethink your limits. All right. Now we're going to get to Psalm 13. Turn there. But you need to accept your limitations. And I don't mean lower your expectations. I mean to rethink your limitations. We all have limitations in life. We've been created that way. God set it up that way and for a purpose, all right? So here's the thing. Don't lower your expectations, but instead rethink your limitations. I want you to pause and think with me for a moment. How about this? Jesus got tired. I mean, we could just hang out there for a moment. Jesus got tired. We often in worship in particular, we, we tend to focus on the divinity of Christ. But today, it's really going to help us to focus on the humanity of Christ. If you don't do both, fully God, fully man, you will enter into shaky theology at best. You'll enter into heresy at worst. Jesus was fully human, and he got tired. Okay, so to do this, to remove his humanity, I think some of us struggle with a Savior who is fully human, but he was and for us to think otherwise is to enter into what was the Gnostic you know, heresy of the first century. But I want you to see this. In Matthew 4, he shows up at Jacob's well. Maybe you know the story. And it says, so there Jesus, okay, wearied as he was from his journey. That word kapieo in the Greek, uh, wearied, means tired. It means exhausted. Jesus is exhausted. So what does he do? He sits down. I mean, this may be, and it's noon, it's, it's hot, and so he sits down. Jesus got tired and he sat down. That may be the, the application point of this message for you today or this week, just to be released to know it's okay to be tired. Jesus got tired. Consider him in the garden, for instance, when he was so filled with emotional distress, and physical distress and anxiety, that he cried out to God that his circumstance would change and he's crying out, sweating drops of blood. Jesus knew what it was to be exhausted. And we're so tired and weary. Our students are tired of all the restrictions. Our single adults, young and old, are tired of being alone. Some of our couples, we're tired of being together. It, we're tired. We've got kids 24-7. I mean, there's, there's no wonder you're exhausted. I'd be surprised if you're not exhausted. Some of us feel like, man, I can't rest. I can't stop. But listen, there's, there's someone who would say to you, hey, I'm not going to judge you. It's okay to rest. You know that? Jesus would say that. God rested, did he not? Not because he got tired. But it, it, listen, Jesus said this. The Sabbath was not made for man. Uh, not, not, no, the, the Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath is what he said. And then he goes on to say this. This is interesting in our context today. He said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That is that we find rest ultimately in Him. But He called Himself, watch this, Son of Man. He called Himself Son of Man more than He called Himself Son of God. In fact, that's, we, we call Him Son of God. He called Himself Son of Man. Now, why is that? I think He's reminding us, I'm fully man. And, and, and two, you know, I don't have to say I'm Son of Man. You, you'd say, well, of course you are, Jeff. But no, He was the Son of God. And He constantly said, I'm the son of man. Listen, it's okay to be tired. The God man Jesus got tired. Praise God. Uh, Hebrews 4.15, it says a priest, uh, a high priest that we have that sympathizes with all of our weaknesses. So in the midst of this unending pandemic, our exhaustion is compounded by the waiting. We don't like to wait because waiting takes us out of control. Waiting reminds us that we're not in control of even the smallest details in our lives. So David writes this song for us and it's in the Psalter, it's in the scriptures and it's called a psalm of lament which make up about a third of all the psalms. In Psalm 13, David's walking through a personal challenge. 
a season of great fear and anxiety and and, and, and he's got people coming after him. All of the Christian life is waiting, and David here is waiting. Psalm 13 breaks down like this. Okay, there's three kinds of, uh, really, really, kind of a, three kinds of uh, verses here in, in, in the psalm. Uh, there's, first, there's four questions. So there's this refrain that is sung. This is meant to be sung over and over again, four times, and it's a question. How long? How long? How long? And then there's three prayers in the middle. That's verses three and four. And then there's two proclamations at the end in verses five and six or songs of praise. One commentator broke, broke it down this way. He said, it's a sigh, uh, it's a soft prayer, and then it's a song of praise. So I want you to apply this by thinking about how you can identify this maybe one place in your life where you're waiting. Maybe it's one area of your life where you're just exhausted. Or maybe it's just this general sense. But the more specific you can be, the more helpful this will be. First thing I want you to see is to rethink. Again, rethink your limits. We're going to see this in verses 1 and 2. It's okay to have feelings of discouragement and exhaustion. Last week we said this. This is so important as we move into the Word of God here. Last week we said that it's the facts about God that should drive us and guide us in our lives, not our feelings. And yet we have feelings, right? We all have feelings. So what do you do with your feelings? You bring them before God. This is so important. This is the first step as we rethink our limits. Because as we do, we come before God and we recognize we're right sized before him and we realize that we need him. Bring your feelings to God. David does this on repeat. He does this during extended times of, of struggle. Keep bringing your request to God. Now, he's going to do it over and over again. How long, how long? It's like our children. How long until we're there? It's your spouse. You know, how long are you going to keep leaving the toilet seat up? Or how long are these dishes going to be in the sink? We're asking, how long? And here, we're crying out to God. And David says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Look, he's saying, like, he feels abandoned here. He, he, and he's, he's asking, how long is this going to take? Like, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Now, this is an indictment on God. He's saying, you've turned your face away from me. The very focus or person that you are, you've turned away. And then in verse 2, he says, How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? He's asking, How long shall my, my enemy be exalted over me? How long? How long do I just stay in my head about this? I mean, he's, he's just bringing it to himself. He's got no help outside of himself, he's saying. But listen, we've got to rethink our limits. Because when we do, it drives us to God. It causes us to, to cry out to Him. And this is what David teaches us over and over again. We've got to speak truth to ourselves. When you know, oh, my soul, he cries out. We Listen, self-talk will kill you if you're not speaking truth to yourself. So where do you get the truth? We get the truth from God's Word. We get the truth from him. We get the truth from others. Otherwise, you're just up in your head and it becomes this echo chamber of hearing the same old thing over and over again. you got to be in his word. Where do you get the truth? You get it from his word, from the spirit. You get it from other believers. Are you in the word? How long, oh Lord? Sometimes his answer is uh, longer. A little bit longer. See, sometimes waiting is as much an action of faith as, as really taking control of a situation. I've learned this as a disciple, as a father, as a pastor. It takes wisdom to keep in step with the Spirit. I love what Eugene Peterson says. He says, waiting in prayer is a disciplined refusal to act before God. Acts. See, if, if God answered every prayer that we offered, man, we'd be in a heap of trouble. Because you don't need everything that you want. And, and we'd also be uh, like selfish brats, wouldn't we? Like, I mean, you ever been around a child that gets everything they want? So you don't need everything. So we're asking how long, Lord, how long? See, there's a natural delay between planting and harvesting. There always is. There's always a delay. And so you, you reap in a different season that you sow. And now we're, we're sowing in this season. This, the perspective that people have on time and waiting is one of the most profound ways that our culture is out of sync with a biblical worldview. We don't wait uh, well. We don't teach our kids to wait. We, we, we give them what they want, if you will. We don't wait until we get married. We don't wait to restrain ourselves you know, from getting that thing that we want. We take drastic measures 
Um, instead of waiting through the hard work of, say, losing weight or getting healthy, we don't wait when it comes to... We do crazy things financially because we don't wait, right? The way we wait is a powerful testimony to our children and to people watching, a watching world, an anxious culture. Uh, it is a powerful thing to show that we know whom uh, we can bring our anxious hearts to. That we have one who holds our tears. He, he struggles with us. So this first point is so important. If you don't accept your limitations, you will demand of God uh, things that he, He's not called you to do. Things that you cannot change or were designed to do. It's okay to be tired. All right, But David keeps coming to God and that's the win. Don't miss this. In his distress, he's crying out. He's feeling all the feels, but he's bringing them to God. Okay, so that's what you do with your feelings. Don't just stay inside your head. Get it out. Say it. All right. Then secondly, I want you to see this. Restart your focus. Verses 3 and 4. There is a lot of focus on himself in these first verses, right? And if we just turn our exhaustion, our discouragement, disappointment into ourselves and just get in our heads again, we're just going to implode, right? So this reset of our focus comes in the form of three prayers here. Look at verse 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies uh, say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. See, now David focuses his request on the Lord. Look at what they are, three of them. Consider me is the first one. In seasons of pain and suffering, waiting, we humble ourselves. We are, in fact, humbled before God. We know that we need him. And so this is why the first and best prayers always help. Help. Lord, consider me. Then he says, answer me. Please, God, answer my prayers. Then his specific prayer, light up my eyes. Light me up. This is another, another translation. It's give, bring the sparkle back to my eyes, Lord. He feels like he's just going to die through all of this. Lord, I can't make it through this without you. And so when we walk through pain and seasons of, of struggling and suffering and questioning, we can turn, bring our request to God. Are you doing that in these days? But again, we've got to bring our feelings, our emotions to him. So keep crying out to him. See, sometimes no is the answer to our prayers. Sometimes it's wait, and yes, sometimes it's yes. But he's getting you ready for something bigger, something better, and he's preparing you for it even now. He's more interested in shaping your character than he is just uh, you know, answering every single prayer that you have. So in 1 Peter 1 and 6, look at what it says here. Uh, in 6 and 7, in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The challenges you face are testing your faith, refining your faith for your good into his glory. Waiting is always a test. Will you trust in him? It's why Paul says, you know, in, in, uh, in Romans, he talks about how it's like being pregnant in Romans 8. You know, it's, it's, it's the waiting that does not diminish us any more than, a, than the waiting diminishes a pregnant woman. In bed, instead, well, she's pregnant and she's getting larger. We're enlarged by the waiting is what he says. And, and through it all, we're, 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 we're getting bigger and bigger with joyful expectancy. He says that's what waiting does in us. That's a wild uh, analogy there. He says, meanwhile, the, the moment that we get tired of waiting, he said even God's spirit comes alongside us and even shows us and even prays for us in our world, wordless sighs and in our aching groans. He says, hey, you know, we, we know that God knows our, our pregnant condition and he keeps us present before himself. So he's at work in all things. He's doing something good. A baby is coming in that case. And he, that's what he, he gives us this analogy in Romans 8, 24 through 28, where he says, hey, listen, he's working in all things. He doesn't say that all things are good, but he says that somehow by his sovereignty, he's all powerful. He's working together for our good in all things. You know, the Bible has 7,000 promises. And if we can hold on and claim, how about this? If we know those promises, we can hold on if we trust him that he sees the bigger picture. It's like, it's like Jennifer said, we see one pixel. He sees the whole picture. 
and we can trust him. But you got to know scripture. I encourage you to memorize scripture, be in the word. One of the things that helps me in the waiting and in the praying is to journal my thoughts. That's another way to get it out there, right? I'd say, say it out loud, speak it, sing it. All right. So look at the third thing I want you to see. Finally, is to recalibrate your heart. Okay, we've got to we got to rethink our limits. We got to we got to reset our focus, and then we've got to constantly recalibrate our hearts. In verses five and six, David now responds with worship. Uh, a recalibrate. I love that word. Everything in the Christian life recalibrates back to Jesus, His passion, His purpose, His person. See, to recalibrate it means to 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 adjust. It means to reset, to return to to a guiding standard. It means to refocus. You could say it means to retune. I love what the the old hymn writer uh, Robert uh, Robinson wrote when he penned the lyrics to that old hymn, "Come Thou Fount." Tune my heart to sing Thy praise. I love that. He's 22 years old, by the way, when he wrote that new song. Our worship needs to constantly be recalibrated back to him. Our hearts tuned to his truth. So when we're going through distress and exhaustion, those times clarify and reveal our worship. Don't miss this. Right now you're being put through a test. And the test is what or whom do you worship, really? You know, a lot of people, if you, if you come to Christ thinking, I'll become a Christian, then everything will go well with me. Or I become a Christian, now I have some like superpower. And I can do things that I, I couldn't do otherwise. Now, there's some truth. We've got the Spirit of God in us, right? But if you believe that you come to Christ and then things are going to go well, or you turn to God because you want things to go so well with you, you'll end up pursuing God for what you want from Him and not simply because He's God. I mean, this is the whole story of Job, right? Satan asked God at the beginning, hey, does Job worship God for nothing? And he's implying that, like what happens for us, he's implying, could it be that, that we just worship God when he's good to us, when he blesses us, and if he doesn't, we don't worship him? I mean, this cuts to the heart of true worship. Most people in the world worship God that way, if they worship him at all, but not followers of Christ. The thing that you see in Job is what we see with David here. He keeps on coming to God with all of his emotions. He's shouting at him. He's pleading with him. He's stating his case with him. And that's the win. Listen, God's big enough for us to climb up into his lap and just pound his chest and cry out to him. And that is the win. Because it's in that that, that, he, that he works in our lives. But we see Job, we see David, he's turning to God. Are you doing that? Are you coming before him? Because in the end, we've said it before, Job doesn't get his answers. You may not get all your answers, but he gets God. He gets something better. And he learns that God is enough regardless of what he's going through. This is why the pattern of weekly worship is so important for us. It's why being in the word every single day is critical. It's why you need to have a regular pattern of prayer in your life. Keep on coming to him. You might say, well, Jeff, but there are times I don't feel like it. That's your problem. It's not about your feelings. You bring your feelings to God. You express them before him. That's what David does. But look at what he does. He remembers who God is and what he's done. That's worship. You see, in verse 5, he says, but I've trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. He remembers, I have trusted in your unfailing, unstoppable, okay, unending love. I'll rejoice in your salvation. Look at verse 6. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is a long way from verses 1 and 2 when he was asking, how long, how long? But look at this. His circumstances haven't changed. His feelings haven't changed. But his heart is recalibrated back to the truth. Now, watch this. Facts are guiding his feelings. That's how this plays out. And then look at what, he, what he's doing here. What, what are the facts? All right. Well, he is faithful and loving. I've trusted in your steadfast love. God is always faithful. He's always loving. Always. He does not change. Even when your emotions, our circumstances change, you got to hold true to what you already know. This is one of the hardest things in the waiting, through exhaustion. When you're weary and tired, one of the hardest things is to remember what you already know about God and hold on to that. And then it says, hey, declare it. I believe it, so I'm going to say it. Sing it like David. Look at this. He then says, hey, here's another fact. He is our salvation. 
Then now this is a statement about what he's done. The first statement, he's loving and faithful. Uh, he's faithful and loving is, is, a, is a statement about his character. Now he says, I'm going to worship the God of my salvation. Now it's a statement about what he's done, his salvation. See, when you remember who he is and what he's done, you're going to turn to the Lord like David. You can join along David and say, I will sing to him. I will worship him. I will proclaim that he's good, even in the midst of trial and struggle and discouragement. Listen, we're not waiting on him to come and rescue us. He already has. So here's the twist in this sermon. Many of us are waiting on God or we're exhausted. How long, how long we've been asking the question. Could it be that God is waiting on you? He's waiting on you to turn to him. Jesus says, come to me. And in that passage that we've been looking at a lot in this season, really throughout the year, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, look at how it reads in the message. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. This is the call of Jesus, the rabbi, to his disciples, to an apprentice that would come to him. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a, a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love that. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That's how you survive exhaustion. So again, apply this to your life. Maybe it's that area. What are you waiting for? What are you just exhausted? You're just tired about in your life. Rethink your limits. Reset your focus. Recalibrate your worship. Remember who he is and what he's done. And remember the gospel. Just look at the cross. Listen, if God never does another thing for you, all the days of your life, if from this moment on your life just goes southbound and it gets harder and harder until the day you die, He's already done enough for you to worship Him now and throughout all eternity. And remember the one on the cross who cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was abandoned so that you would not be. He took on our shame and our punishment so that we wouldn't have to. He was left dying alone so that you and I would know the presence of God in these greatest moments of despair and discouragement. Our Savior has done all that needs to be done. What a Savior who died for us so that we could live forever. So as we close, listen, I want to encourage you. Uh, you, you feel like God is, 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 you're waiting on God? He's waiting on you. He's waiting on us now to turn to Him, given what we know is true about Him and to hold on and give our lives to Him. So I want to pray. I want to close in prayer right now. If you'll just bow your head, close your eyes. Maybe you could hold your palms up where you're seated, seated right there, wherever you are. Just as an act to say, Lord, here I am. I release all that I've been holding on to. I've been clinging to so much anxiety, so much shame that's coming my way about decisions I'm making or not making. Lord, I'm exhausted. And I'll lay my life before you. I give you my life trust you. I recalibrate my life according to the truth that I know about you, that you're good and loving. And friend, if you've never received Jesus, you can just ask him in your heart right now by faith, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Just say that. I give you my life. Now make me the person you've created me to be as I trust in you, regardless of what comes my way. Lord, we love you. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.